Welcome everyone to Community Connections. My name is Todd Selecta and I'm the Director of Education and Communications for People Care Health Services. People Care Health Services' mission is to enable individuals to live better by supporting their overall health, dignity, choice, and independence through advocacy, education, and quality services performed with integrity. Community Connections is part of that commitment to education and advocacy, seeking to connect our caregivers, clients, and stakeholders with various individuals and organizations throughout the community that may, in some way, be of support. So we're glad that you've made time to join us today. Before we get started, we want to remind you that we have muted your microphones so that we don't pick up any inadvertent background noise. However, if you have a question, please type it in the chat box in the bottom right-hand corner of the GoToMeeting box, and I will look for an opportunity to present them to our guest. You can also text them to me at 303 489 2155 or send them via email to our education and social media specialist Devin Omoto at Devin O at peoplecarehs.com and we will do our best to address them in the order they are received. This month's topic is preparing for emergencies and our guest is Carolyn Bloom of the Denver Office of Emergency Management and Homeland Security. Carolyn is an emergency management community relations specialist and has over 30 years in-depth experience in emergency management educational seminar media interview presentations, working with local, state, national government agencies, the private sector, disaster preparedness, mitigation, and damage assessment. She worked alongside FEMA, the state of Florida, Broward County Emergency Management, and the insurance industry prior to, during, and the recovery of Hurricane Andrew. If you've joined us via internet, you should be able to see the slide presentation on your screens. I'm going to turn it over to you now, Carolyn, but on behalf of People Care Health Services, welcome to Community Connections. So, Todd, if you'll go ahead and advance the slide. We're going to talk about Colorado hazards. We're going to go over organizational structure of what Denver looks like, and then I'll bring in some of the other jurisdictions and what they look like. Um, we're going to talk about the Emergency Operations Center, so when we get activated and what we do and how we do it a little bit. Um, the phases of emergency management and what we do to try to make sure that everyone gets to know what they're supposed to do during the disaster event. And then we're going to go into individual and, and family preparedness and the whole community concept. So if you'll go ahead and move forward. One of the things that we do here in Denver is we have a mission of preparing and mitigating response recovery on a, on a disaster event. We also try to build on resiliency. The re resiliency of our communities and of our agencies is only going to bring us back as quicker and better than we were prior to an event. Um, we also look at the resiliency of our communities and if we have our communities better prepared, our resiliency in their particular area is better for everyone. So if we'll go ahead and we also think about the fact that every disaster starts local and ends local. In Colorado Springs just a, a couple weeks ago with the high winds when we had all the trucks turning over, we had an area that had um, about 1,300 homes were without power. That was a local event. And those folks individually, they owned their own event. And it didn't end until the locals were done prepared, done with that event. Right now, um, they're preparing some of the roofs on the houses and buildings that were blown off. And so they're still not done with the total of recovery yet. So just remember, we are we own it, the locals, that's me and you, own our own disaster event from cradle to grave. So just think about that a little bit because government can't do it all. And you'll see that as we go through. Go ahead. In Colorado, we have a, a bunch of different disasters. One of the, a few of them that we worry about the most is severe weather, winter weather, like they're having in Vail, <laughs> in the mountain areas on Highway 70 right now, um, today, 
and they're trying to keep those roads cleared, even though they're getting 20 to 25 inches of snow dropping in a day. Um, so we try to keep commerce moving. We try to keep the people moving because our our mountain areas depend on those tourists that come in. So and also the locals from the Front Range and the Western Slope that all like to go skiing. That's what they their um, their economy is actually thriving on. When you talk about um, wildland fires, we're all concerned about wildland fires. Even in the Denver Valley and over in the Western Slope in Grand Junction, we may not experience the actual fire, but we will experience the people who are moving out of the areas that the wildland fire is in. And we also have to worry about the health and the well-being of the people who um, need good air quality. And that's most of us, most of the time, but some are more vulnerable than others. So we try to try to make sure that um, we address all of those things. One of the things you won't see on the list is the tsunami in a hurricane. Um, if we get those here in Colorado, we're all in trouble. But in the um, in the with the um, with the fact that we go to Mexico, to the Yucatan Peninsula, or we go to Florida for vacations, we still need to make sure that we prepare the same same way that we would prepare for a blizzard in a long period of time without things. Um, we also talk about man-made disasters and technological disasters. That's that power outage, communication outage. Um, cybersecurity, all of those things that are now pushing their pushing themselves into our everyday lives. Um, you want to go ahead and go to the next slide? This is a structure in Denver. We're actually, as the emergency management office here in Denver, we actually sit underneath the mayor's office. Unlike Grand Junction, they sit in the um, fire office, fire department. And in Mesa County and in El Paso County, the emergency management offices, generally speaking, sit in the sheriff's office because he is the fire marshal. So you can you can see that your your emergency management office may be in another location other than the mayor's office. But I would look to the law enforcement in the county offices, and I would look to the fire in the um, in the city offices because they generally are the ones who own um, the emergency management offices. Go ahead. This is our structure here. As you can see, um, we don't have a whole lot of people to be able to answer to a disaster event. Um, we have six of us who are actually Office of Emergency Management or Office of Emergency Management employees. I'm sorry, seven. We have a, a staff assistant. There's seven of us in the emergency management office. Under the Urban Area Security Program, which is um, Homeland Security, um, a Homeland Security event um, grant. And then we have two little liaisons that come from police and fire. So if you look at the structure, there's four people. There's six people who can actually work a, an event. So we have a little over 100,000 people per person in the emergency management office that will actually um, be able to serve the people of Denver. Um, go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, we have a duty officer program. The, the seven people who actually do that, we alternate once every 24 or at once every seven days. And as we alternate in those seven days, we're on 24 hours. When the airplane slid off the runway at DIA, I was the duty officer, and that was December of 19. 19, oh, I'm sorry, 2008, it slid off the, the runway. The only thing that happened was a broken leg, and 
that was a great thing that we only had a broken leg off that. Um, when we work during the weekends, we go about our business and do what we do. But however, when we have a big event going on, we are always aware of, of what's going on around the city. Um, when we activate the Emergency Operations Center, that, that's what the EOC stands for, is an Emergency Operations Center, which is the photograph that you have there. The resources that come together in the Emergency Operations Center is police, fire, EMS, the normal players when we have an event like that. But we also have public works. We have the Department of Environmental. We have, um, if it's an event where we have um, deaths, we may have the morgue and the individual who, um, coroner's office, that's what I was looking for. <laughs> the coroner's office there. We also bring in the, the um, RTD for our transportation and things like that. So we have a wide variety of individuals. And by the next slide, I will, um, I believe it's the next, the next slide shows you that um, when we're activated, when we can take care of it as, as the actual um, local office here, when it's only our staff, then with, we need to bring in other people to help us with the particular event. We go up a level, or down a level, it's up a level, in the core support functions. The core support functions are like police, fire, and EMS, if we're talking about a fire, or if we're talking about arson, or um, those types of things. When we're talking more about non-core would be um, our other partners, like the transportation. When the event gets so large, and we have to make we we have to make policy decisions that may affect the um, may affect the city's laws and regulations. Like we have to shovel snow within 24 hours to have clean sidewalks and driveways. If we can't get it done in the 24 hours because we've had so much snow the policymakers would come in and say, okay, we have 48 hours to shovel the snow instead. And those, the policymakers are made up of police, chief, fire chief, the mayor, um, public works, and the director, the executive director of emergency management. Go ahead. So we also have a public information office that comes together when we have any major event. Um, what they do is they supply information out to the general public. They also monitor social media. The hardest thing that we have come across in the last five years is trying to keep up with social media, trying to keep up with Twitter, trying to keep up with the Facebook postings and things like that. So we actually have in the state of Colorado a team of, of individuals of 40 individuals who are around the state of Colorado monitoring those particular venues in order to um, make sure that we're catching things that we need to catch. So they're monitoring the Twitter, they're monitoring Facebook, and any other type of, of social media that may be out there that is um, really busy during an event. Um, the Public information officers, they supply the information to the radio. In the Denver area, KOA, which is um, 550 on the radio, is our emergency radio information center. And they, in turn, send out all the information that we need to have going out. Um, and also, you have the television. If you, can, if you still have power and you can watch television, if um, if you have local stations, because some of us don't have local stations anymore, if you have local stations and you can read the, the, the roles on the bottom of the, the television to keep you updated, then you'll have that opportunity too. So all the information comes out of this Joint Information Center, goes to the media, goes to social media because we also do 
our own tweets and our own um, press releases. So go ahead. As you can see, we have a bunch of responders. Um, when we run out of resources, um, what, one of the things that we do is coordinate and try to bring other resources and mobilize other resources and also track the cost of all the resources because our local taxpayers are going to be responsible for paying for those extra resources. We budget so much money for removing snow every year. Hopefully we don't go over that budget. If we happen to have a lot of storms back to back like we did in 2006, then we may go over budget and those budget going over budget requires our taxpayers to pay more taxes, which pay, and we don't want that to happen. So we try to make sure that we stay within the cost of making sure that we don't go over that. Um, and we do reach out to other agencies in the state and private sector. So go ahead. This is where we get our authority from. It's in the it's the it's in the city code that we have authority to do the emergency preparedness and response. And we also, if we have a disaster event in the city and county of Denver, we go to the mayor and the mayor signs the order. Just like when FEMA goes to have a declaration done, they go to the president. So we go from we have to we go from the city, the county, which Denver is one and the same. In other places like um, Colorado, like in El Paso County, you have a home rule city. They go directly to the state. All the other organization, all the other cities and around there, go to the county. The county in turn goes to the state. When you, whenever you have a home ruled city within your county, that particular city goes directly to the state, just like a county can go directly to the state. So those are where you can find, if you want to look them up, there they are, and you're more than welcome to go find them. Go ahead. Okay, the incident happens, and when we're talking about an incident, um, one of, like, if, um, we had the Democratic National Convention. That was a planned event. We had an, we had a lot of uh, quite a few incident commanders in that. The incident may be um, the wine festival over in um, Palisade, or it may be um, these are planned events that happen. If it's an event like a chemical spill that has to be evacuation for that particular chemical spill is um, one that you might have to, you have an incident commander, the incident commander comes to the emergency operations center for additional resources. So we're going to click through this one at a time. So the incident commander, Show incident you. happens, and then from there, no, go we'll ahead and click. Best practices. Okay. So well, we go to the office. Connection of emergency right. management. Then joining via a high-speed um, wire as opposed to Wi-Fi to something, utilize. Something is happening. Yeah, there. we're trying to figure out where that audio is coming from, folks. If you haven't, okay. it looks like we have you all muted. So we're trying to figure out where that audio is coming from. And uh, I think we are good. Okay. So... When, when we are asked for additional resources for the incident that's going on, then we go to our local agencies that are inside the city and county, and then we may go to from Denver to Jefferson County to um, Arapahoe in the surrounding counties around us um, in order to find other cities and other counties that may be able to help us with equipment and um, human resources at the event. Then when we go to the state, if we can't get the stuff that we need from them, when we go to the state, they look at state agencies and go ahead and click one more time. 
and they look at other city agencies such as Colorado Springs and Grand Junction and maybe um, Summit County and maybe some of their resources can come over and help us for um, for an event. Just like the Waldo Canyon fire, the city and county of Denver sent their yes, we have a wildland fire team, that's 31 firefighters, and they went down to Colorado Springs um, for one operational period to help them with the, with the Waldo Canyon fire. So that's a mutual aid opportunity, but the state is the one who actually requested us to go to Colorado Springs. Then you go one more click, and the state declares the disaster, and sends it up to the federal government, and then one more click, and then the president would declare, and we would be able to get resources from the federal government. When we talk about federal resources, and you have, and like for Hurricane Katrina, when you had firefighters from all over the place, or you had emer or you had um, paramedics from all over with their trucks, they are considered a local asset for like Colorado Springs, but at that particular point they are a federal resource. So I hope I clear I hope I said that clear enough for everybody to understand. So we'll go to the next slide. Now these are the different functions that we have that we have to coordinate with communications, transportation, public works, information and planning. That is where the emergency management office is actually that is number five. Um, the one that we have um, that we bring in outside partners for is mass care with the um, temporary housing and the sheltering human services, those types of things to be able to give the people what they need to have. One of the things that we have problems um, or strong opportunities in, in today's time in the metro area is the temporary housing. It's very difficult to get temporary housing here in Denver in the metro area. And I know that there's some premium over in Grand Junction and over down in Colorado Springs too, that when it comes to trying to put people back into temporary housing, it becomes a struggle because we run out of what we need. We run out of the resource. Um, we have logistics management. You can go ahead to the next slide. Um, the the medical when we have um, when we have scares for like um, H1N1 a couple years ago, we, they're the ones who are the lead agencies, and not police and fire. They're the ones who control all the medical, all those things. Search and rescue generally comes out of police, I mean, generally comes out of fire. However, everyone was working a couple weeks ago looking for that little boy who fell in the, the lake. Um, and so there was a lot of people out. We even had volunteers out looking for this little boy. And that was an urban search and rescue opposed to a um, a rural search and rescue. When you're looking out in the rural area, you may be working on a grid, walking side by side by somebody else looking for a certain thing. Um, public safety, that belongs to the law enforcement. Long-term recovery, generally speaking, belongs to the Office of Emergency Management and also our volunteer organizations. Um, it's Colorado it's Colorado VOAD, which is Volunteer Organizations Active in Disasters. We have quite a few of them here. We have an organization with with them, and, and so that's part of that. And we went through the public information when we went through the other. If you'll go ahead. These are the, this is the, the actual mitigation preparedness response, recovery, and as soon as you get done with this circle, you start all over again to make sure that you can improve for the next one. So if you'll go ahead. And we're going to move from here in talking about individual um, and family preparedness and the community preparedness. And the next slide will be a video that we come to 
that okay. I would like you all to see. Every individual can take important steps to prepare for emergencies and put plans in place in case of a disaster in your community. If you have a disability or other access or functional need, you may have to take additional steps to protect yourself and your family. People with disabilities and uh, people who have access and functional needs have to take a very proactive uh, position in their personal preparedness. If you think about it, we do it every day. We're ready for the next little disaster that we will face every day. I always say prepare as if no one's coming to rescue you um, because the reality is in a moderate or large event, no one is coming to rescue you anytime soon. It may be a very short period of time, it may be a more extended period of time, but you need to prepare as if you're not going to have any of the resources that you might typically depend on. The best way people can start to plan is by looking at the individual part of their daily lives and figuring out where the potential gaps are. Do an inventory of yourself, do an inventory of the things that you use on a daily basis um, to be living independently, and then think about what is essential. Think about the strategies, services, devices, tools and techniques you use to live with a disability on a daily basis. These may include medications, durable medical equipment, service animals, assistive technology, communication tools, and transportation. You really have to be focused as to what are your needs if you end up going to a shelter for four or five days, or if you're stuck and sheltering in place because people just can't get to you. What are the essential things that you're going to need um, to be able to survive? As you think about assembling a support team, you need to be thinking about who are the people in your workplace, who are the people in your neighborhood, who are the people in your community, who might be able to assist you. Go over your emergency plan with everyone in your support network. Make sure that someone in your personal support network has an extra key to your home and knows where you keep your emergency supplies. And teach them how to use any life-saving equipment or administer medicine in case of an emergency. It's important that you find out in those places where you receive services on a regular basis, you find out what their emergency plans are. Ask them. Uh, if you are a person who gets dialysis, what are their emergency plans? If you're a person who uses paratransit system, uh, paratransit services, wh what, are, what are their emergency plans for providing paratransit? A standard emergency kit includes water, food, and medicine to sustain all members of your household for at least three days. Visit ready.gov for a complete list of suggested items along with recommendations for how to prepare a family emergency plan. Everybody needs to have a kit and a kit really needs to have some very basic things in it, some water, some food. But then you're going to want to customize that kit to make sure that it has the things that you need. Individuals with access and functional needs may want to consider some of the following items. Extra glasses or hearing aids battery chargers or extra batteries, copies of medical prescriptions, supplies for service animals, and necessary medical supplies. Visit ready.gov for a complete list of suggested emergency items for people with access and functional needs. People with disabilities and access and functional needs are their own emergency managers. They know what they need on an everyday basis. And what my kit looks like is very different than somebody else just kept. You want to be thinking about what is it going to take for you both in your home and out of your home to be able to maintain your health, your safety, your independence for a period of, you know, a few hours to perhaps a few days. Preparedness is actually a 365 day a year activity that all of us should take very seriously. It's important that every day we do a little something to keep ourselves as prepared as we possibly can. The most empowering thing you can do is take charge for yourself. During disaster, during the little storms and the big storms. And that's probably the most positive thing you can ever do for yourself as a person. Because that gives you control. That gives you control over the outcomes. Download this brochure about preparing for disaster for people with disabilities and other access and functional needs from ready.gov. 
Check out the other information available on the site and get started preparing today. Um, one of the things I'm going to bring up is that this particular video is online at um, on ready.gov. There's several different videos that are available there. And what, what I would suggest you to do is, is go to the website and see some of these videos um, that would pertain to you. I have information in the next slide that we can just go ahead and go to that if you want to. Okay, so what they were talking about in there, in that particular video, is information pertaining to personal preparedness, employee preparedness, volunteers. Um, one of the reasons why you want your employees um, prepared if personally is to make sure that they show up to work. Because if you don't have them showing up to work, then your business is not going to thrive. Basic awareness, go back please. Go back when? Okay. Basic awareness. We have family preparedness. Important documents. Those important documents. People came here from um, from Katrina, and they didn't even have their driver's license. So they would come up and say that I am John Smith, and I used to live here, but there was no identification to prove that. So we suggest people to put their personal documents on a flash drive um, to scan them in. Personal documents such as birth certificates, social security cards, driver's license, um, let's see, um, marriage certificates, death certificates, your adoption papers for those who have adopted, any kind of documents that you need to know about. Um, one of those that you need to have is all of your prescriptions written down somewhere with um, the information on how to um, do that. Where we generally tell you to do to do um, 72 hours worth of planning, but we're going to tell you to do seven days because one of the things that you're going to you need to do is understand that we are we are our own emergency manager. We have to plan for ourselves. We have to know that we are not going to have immediate service by 911 because they may be servicing someone else. And so it's very important to know that you may be by yourself for days. In the floods in 2013, there was people who did not see a first responder for six days. That's important to know because if you have to have your medications and, and things like that, you need to be prepared for that. You need to make the, um, you need to know, um, one of the things that are coming to you, um, you need to plan on your own. So that, that's really important. To, if, I, if you don't get anything else out of this, make sure that you take care of yourself. Workplace readiness. I work 55 miles away from my work location. I live 55 miles down in Black Forest. And so when um, I leave home, and I know there's a storm coming, and it's a winter storm coming, or a lot of rain is coming, thunderstorms are coming in late afternoon, I may bring my stuff to stay. And I bring my stuff to stay and I have stuff in my, in, um, I have enough food to feed me for three days in my drawers and things like that here in my desk. And then you have recovery. And recovery is, a tough, is the toughest thing because the recovery takes forever and you may not ever recover um, totally. So go ahead. These are a list of things that you might want to put in your personal kit. You might want to have them in your car. Um, the folks, if they get stuck in their cars up in the mountains and they're there for 15, 20 hours because the snow is moving so quickly and they can't get out of their cars, they may want to have food, water, um, a flashlight, a radio 
to make sure that they keep up with the information of the weather report. Um, they may want to have garbage bags and um, plastic ties to make sure that they can throw things away. Um, and there again, there's important documents on that list. Go ahead. And cash. When there's a disaster event and there's no power, you got to have cash. You have to have coins to be able to pay for things. Um, your cell phone may not work. Um, when we had the, the, the Super Bowl party downtown last year, we lost our uh, cell towers for about an hour and a half when they had the event in, um, out in Boston for the Boston Marathon. The government, after that happened, took the cell towers down 15 minutes after the event. Not that it was trying to be mean to the public, but they didn't want communications going on with other, with, with ter other terrorist activities. You want to make sure that you bring your medical equipment, your eyeglasses, hearing aids, um, make sure you have a couple of jackets in the car, warm blankets. And I know this sounds like a lot, but you can pack it in a nice, neat little package, and um, it won't take up that much room. Books and magazines, that's so you're not going to get bored while you're during the event. If you go to a shelter and you don't have anything to do, you're going to get bored. So you might want to have that. Or playing cards, games, things like that. Go ahead. When we're talking about the animals and service animals and pets, pets are not allowed in shelters, human shelters. Um, service dogs are, and service um, many horses are. But everything else are not allowed in, in the generally in the shelter. We try to put them together um, in the same geographical areas so you can take care of your pets and take care of them. You might want to make sure that you have your pet's favorite toy. I have a dog who has his puppy and he's going to sleep with his puppy no matter what. So you might want to make sure that you have that. Um, and a manual can opener if you happen to have dog food that doesn't have the pull tabs. Go ahead. Try to keep situational awareness um, with you. You can get the weather report on your phone. You can get the weather report from um, other sources. You can also um, check the cameras for the art, um, art for CDOT. Department of Transportation for the state of Colorado, you can pull those up before you actually leave your house or leave your location to go to the mountains to see how the roads are to make sure that you're you're going to be safe and you're going to need you're going to have everything you need. Social media is another way that we're pushing out information for communication. Okay? Go ahead. Outdoor warning systems. Some cities do have outdoor warning systems. We have them in, in Denver. And outdoor warning systems, if they go off, they mean to go inside. If you're inside and you can't hear them going off, there's a reason. You're supposed to be inside. Um, so the emergency alert system, please, please don't ever turn off your wireless um, phone emergency alert system. I know you get the Amber Alerts on it, and it, you may not want them, but we also need you to get other alerts from us because we have the capability with the Offices of Emergency Management to send those informa that information out. If you have a landline, you would receive the um, alerts by phone. If you have your cell phone, you're going to receive them through the wireless emergency alert system, but they don't interact with each other. Um, so if you don't have a landline, you're not going to get those reverse calls, alert calls from the dispatch area, dispatch for police and fire and EMS. Go ahead. Did you pull? 
Did you go to the school yard? Calm down, please. So where did you look? We, 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 we can make a plan somehow if we just, if I just. He's a smart boy and he's going to be okay. Okay, try to call him again. There's no reception right now. Everything is down. Try. I can't. Try already. Nothing's working. Well, just Everything's try. down. Do you think he's on his way? Tell me he's okay. I need you to calm down. What? It's my baby. But this is so bad. I just, he's out there by himself. Make sure you know where to find your family in an emergency. Start your plan at ready.gov. And um, we talk about the recovery of, of the a disaster event. Nobody recovers the same. The same event may not impact you as much as it impacts someone else, it's very difficult to say, I know how you feel, because even if you're in the same event, you don't know how they feel. Um, we are resilient, and we do bounce back. However, there's a lot of a depression that comes in after the event, sometimes three months later, six months later, and we have experienced a lot of spousal abuse. It's normal and domestic abuse. It's normal to feel sad. It's normal to grieve. It's normal to get angry and a whole bunch of other emotions that and cry. It's it's all normal. What you're doing is you're acting normally to a non-normal event. So it's okay to do that. Um, when you need help, be strong enough to let people help you. Um, that's so important. It's healthy to accept help and let them let people help you come in. And if you have to demuck your your um, your basement, let the folks come in to help you. And that would make it a whole lot better for them and you because they're they want to give you the help that they can bring you. Go ahead. Our private sector, um, our private sector brings a lot of goods and services to us, and but when they bring you, bring in a, a, a truckload of stuff, generally they bring it with a truck driver, and we need help for people to help us unload those um, those trucks, and we may put out a call that we need 50 volunteers to go help. The volunteer organizations active in disasters, if that information is, if you just Google that, it will come up. And there's a national organization and a state organization, and there's a couple of locals. Um, Boulder has one, um, Colorado Springs has a VOAD, um, and there's there's some throughout the, the, the state. Um, Colorado Emergency Preparedness Partners are a lot of our corporations who have joined that particular organization, and they help with with bringing in resources that we might need after a disaster event. What comes to mind is Home Depot, who in Lowe's, who actually bring in extra wood and extra cleaning supplies and all of that kind of stuff in order for us to be able to clean up our mess. Hey, Carolyn, uh, we, have, we had one question come in and say, can a company like ours join that network, um, or are they looking for specific companies to join that network? Oh, no, everybody. <laughs> we need everybody, um, especially the healthcare um, and in the home health care. We need you guys a lot. Um, and the caregivers organizations, we need them, too, because the government does not know where people are aging in place. We don't know where people with disabilities are. We don't know where the people who are getting care after surgery um, with the home health care. I had that for two months. The government didn't know I had home health care coming in, and nor was I going to tell them. It wasn't their business. Um, <laughs> well, so, yeah. Actually, that, that, that same person did a follow-up question. They said, um, they're asking what happens if we are part of that networks. Is it by like a disaster by zip code that we're alerted, or is it 
a phone call to um, our, our corporate office or our agency office? What, what does it mean? How do we get it activated is what I think they're trying to say if we're part of that network. That network would be what there would be a call that goes out to your corporation and then they would um, be able to utilize the resources that they have, which is you, to come to the table. If you happen to be part of a church um, and you're on a response team in a church or you feed the homeless once a month or go to the soup kitchen once a month, those those types of organizations are also called in to be able to feed and shelter folks. Um, All right, thanks. That was that was just a question that came to us. So, okay, thank you. Go ahead. As you can see, as the whole community, this list I have here pretty much doesn't leave anybody out. Um, when you're talking about the aging population, the boomer population who are retiring, they they are some of our biggest assets also because they're full of life. They they're busy into their 70s and or into their 80s and 90s. And if we can utilize some of those folks for um, at our disaster assistance centers or our sheltering centers, it helps us be able to recover type of thing. We even use people with disabilities, people with disabilities. Um, we had working the radios, amateur radio operators. They were great. They during the floods, they helped people get around the floods and anyway, that they were great. Neighborhood, if we had a neighborhood group in every neighborhood to take care of their neighbors, we wouldn't have to worry because we would be the locals taking care of the locals. And if you go back a couple, back to the beginning, we are, the locals are taking care of ourselves in the beginning, and then we're going to help the locals take care of themselves in the recovery. Um, when you're when you're talking about faith-based organizations, they know their congregation. They can serve their congregation. There's forty. There's sixty-five thousand um, LDS here in the metro area. That's an army that will be able to help come together and take care of the folks. We have the Muslim Society who is also helping with the um, Islamic faith that they can go to the mosque to help get help and take shelter and things like that. So there's a lot of different groups that could actually step up to the plate and help. The youth organizations, you have the um, Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, the Civil Air Patrol, to, to just name three of them. They can actually do sandbagging and help with the sandbagging um, as we, you know, if we needed that for flooding type of thing. And so, I got another question that came in said, so um, again, they're acknowledging Denver has a whole apparatus like this. In like the West Slope, you, your recommendation was to check with local fire or police to see who is the emergency management coordinator for their county or area? Right. Right. And Gunnison um, County has an emergency manager in Gunnison who helps take care of the whole county. And um, Scott is, he's a, he's a great guy. Um, let's see, I know that Grand Junction's in the fire. Colorado Springs is, in, is, is connected with fire, but they're not stationed in, fly, fly in that. But if you get on, if you can get on the internet and just Google emergency management for the city, an emergency management for the county that you live in, you'll be able to find them. It's, it's, they will come up. In the last slide, I do have resources. If you go ahead and advance it, okay. Um, we have community readiness, and the last we're going to get to a slide that has resources where you can find your emergency manager. If you'll just give me one second, um, there it is. We have there's Denver's information. We, the last one is actually the website to go to for the state of Colorado 
for all of the emergency managers here in Colorado. So um, that gives you the opportunity to be able to not have to hunt for it. And the last slide is just any questions. Oh, we went over all of this information from the beginning. So any other questions out there? Yep, and also we saw that one of our um, participants said next door is a sort of a, a neighborhood and by 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 neighborhood or by region um, a networking uh, aspect as well too. So it's an online uh, sort of social network that's grouped by zip code and then even down into subdivision if you're in a area that's a little more populated. Um, there's another way to find it. Uh, one other person asked, um, and this is. And again, I, I'm not trying to make light of it. I guess it's a serious question. I guess so. They were surprised that the that yeah. the government shut down all cell towers during that event, and how that would help or assist in dissuading terrorism. It seems it this is what they wrote. It seems it should be the other way around. To keep that up to help prevent it. Well, the reason why they shut it down is they cut they cut off the communications between the terrorists. If there was more than two, and there was five or six, and they were communicating due to text or do, through the phone system, it would stop them from doing that. Yep. Boston, was also, Boston was also the first city to actually stop transit um, in their city. It's never been done before. Just like shutting down the cell towers would, has so, never been done before. So if I understand you correctly, because there was a mass of people and, and the event was ending, it would have been an opportune time to coordinate and, say, detonate something. So by turning off the cell phones for a set amount of time, it, it actually broke that ability to network. Yes. Okay. It absolutely did. Yep. Are there any other questions that are – a lot of you are private, private messaging me those questions. Thank you. But you could put them publicly there in the chat box if you needed to. Any other questions that you'd like to ask, Carolyn? Well, there's a question on there that says, um, do you have ER tips for um, people with pets? Um, yeah, you do. Um, you need to make plans before, you, before the event comes. When we were evacuated from um, Black Forest, um, our plan was to go east, and they actually evacuated the location that we were going to first. So then we had to figure out a backup plan. So we needed somewhere to take two 60-pound dogs that would actually house us two. And so we got on the phone and started calling people to see if we would be able to go and stay with them. Um, because we were going to leave our dogs behind. So the main thing was is that we did make those different um, calls and we found a place to stay and it wasn't a hotel because all the hotels were already taken. The other thing with um, animals is that they get, is, is their anxiety goes up with your anxiety. So you need, if you can, stay calm and um, they will stay calmer as you go through an event. Um, so just remember that you need to make those plans. And uh, another question came out, how, how, have the, how has the 2013 floods and fires affected emergency preparedness in Colorado? And have we gained knowledge and improved our ability to be prepared? And is that shared um, throughout the other states' emergency management departments? Yeah, we've learned a lot of lessons from that. Um, one of the things that we've been doing is in the state of Colorado, I mean, up there in that area, is they've been working on the, the rivers and the creeks and the road systems to make sure that the drainage is better. And some of those, um, some of those are actually being paid by FEMA mitigation plans or grants. Um, to help us do better so we don't have it happen again. And uh, here's, a, here's one that hits us right at home. In Lake City, um, having a quadriplegic on oxygen, uh, what do you recommend to prepare for this client's needs in the event of an emergency? Yeah, and I'm familiar with Lake City, and you have, you, you're being down in that little valley. Um, you have to be able to have um, oxygen tanks 
to be able to make sure that they continue to, to receive oxygen because they may not be able to charge their uh, mobile oxygen machine. Um, a small generator may be a thought for that particular family that um, they just just big enough to charge the the solar panels that are a 45 watt that might help with that particular situation. And I know none of these are free solutions. Um, however, it's the best I can come up with right at the moment. And that might be a, a call directly to that emergency management area to say, hey, pose that question to them directly. How would you like us to handle it since they service that area? Um, you also said to ensure you have extra medications in case of an emergency um, where you can't refill medication uh, that's critical to you. Other than checking the expiration date in the bottle, do you recommend a way to keep track of your items that expire like food or medication or, or even batteries for that matter? Actually, I rotate, and that brings up a, a, a good, good point too. I rotate mine. When I have a, a pile of bottled water, I start at the top and then I buy a new one when that one's done and it goes up and down all the time. Also, when I go to the grocery store, um, I buy one extra item every week so it doesn't cost me a fortune to, to stock my cabinet. So when I have peanut butter, for an example, I have an open jar of peanut butter and a closed jar of peanut butter. When the open one is gone, I move that one forward and I buy another one. So I always have one full jar of peanut butter that's not been opened. So that way I can rotate my my goods just like the soups and the tunas and all those things. The dry dry ingredients, you rotate them. So but you have one extra one. And in fifty two weeks you can definitely put enough in your cabinet to last a longer time. Thank you. And I also, the, I see the correction down there um, uh, regarding not Lake City, Leadville is what we're talking about. So I appreciate that okay. clarification. <laughs> no, that, that was me. I read, it, I read it directly and I thought there must be a Lake City that I don't know about. Um, so any other questions that are out there for Carolyn? And you can take down my email address and send me questions if you, um, if you have any. You always have me available through my email address. That's the easiest way to get a hold of me and ask me questions. Um, and you're more than welcome to, to, I don't care where you are. I just want people to be safe and take care of themselves. And we have one more, one more question before we go. One parting shot from uh, Sarah, it looks like. For those that may have financial issues, is there a government support mechanism to help purchase uh, emergency response goods, uh, so non-perishables and things like that? Unfortunately, there's not, um, and that's why I suggest people to buy one extra thing to have in their cabinet and to buy things that they will eat, not things that they won't eat. Um, but there is not one, after an event, a whole bunch of stuff comes in, and then we have resources that we can sh share with the public at that point, but until we get stuff coming in, we don't have stuff to give. Okay. Well, and again, like Carolyn said, and she has been very responsive to us um, as a company when we've asked her questions, and uh, she's being very serious. You have her, her email address and her, her, her phone numbers, and I'll tell you what, if she doesn't have the information, most likely she will know where to point you at least to get that information. So, uh, again, that brings us to the end of our, our February Community Connections, and, and Carolyn, on behalf of People Care Health Services and all those that were in attendance, we want to thank you for joining us today. Um, folks, we have recorded this presentation and we'll make it available on our website at www.peoplecarehs.com and you click on the education tab and there you'll see recent video seminars and there you will find links to today's seminar and also all the other ones we've done and we will put Carolyn's um, PowerPoint and uh, this recorded um, session on there as well so you can access it as well. Our next Community Connections will be Wednesday, March 8th at 1 o'clock. 
and we will send out uh, invitations and email and voicemail blasts through the various social media platforms as we had this time. But be sure to like us on Facebook as we are constantly posting helpful hints, links to videos, announcements, and highlighting our clients and our caregiving team. And so with that, again, Carolyn, thank you. And we will bring this Community Connections to a close. Colorado proud and community strong. So on behalf of People Care Health Services folks, thank you for joining us and have a good day. We are going to terminate the call now. Thank you. Thank you.